five, four, three. Hey, hey, we're back. We're back with more Live from the Heartland here on St. Patrick's Day. It's a Baptist Day. We're listening to Gaelic Storm this morning in case uh, you were wondering where some of our music is coming from. I Miss My Home was the last one. And, um, you know, we're just celebrating the season here. Uh, we're going to have filmmaker Dennis Mule in a little bit, but we thought we'd talk a little bit about this event coming up this week that we've had many candidates on the air about, which is the election. And oh, the election, not the basketball game. We'll talk about the basketball game then. <laughs> well, today at 510 is when Loyola plays, so everyone get ready. Yeah, like like anybody listening didn't already kind of have that on their DVR or whatever. Just a reminder. I had to look it up. Yeah, no, I didn't have it. I, I'm being a wise guy. Oh, there's something else new. Uh, <laughs> Katie, you're the one that's working the, the precincts as hard as anyone else in this room right now. That's um, always the case. I don't yeah. know why. Katie Besides is a workhorse. Proliferation of lawn signs outside uh, early voting booths, which uh, I hope we have figured out some way to recycle all that plastic and wire. Um, how are things looking? What kind of energy is there? What what are the Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I spent three hours yesterday uh, poll watching at a nursing home voting moment, um, which not a lot of people see that. And uh, it's it's three hours of basically basically seeing what's wrong with the U.S. Uh, these days. Um, you've got. Uh, a lot of people in a situation that they never wanted to be in um, and they are being cared for by people who are often paid under a minimum wage, uh, under a, a living wage I should say. Um, we have a proliferation of the nursing homes in Rogers Park. So it has traditionally in any neighborhood been a place where certain politicians take advantage of the fact that people are uh, less, uh, in, uh, you know, somewhat encumbered uh, in order to vote, and uh, you know, it's always been a place where some elections are stolen. Um, so, hence the poll watching. Uh, I, I would invite others to who know what it is to poll watch. There's uh, more nursing home voting going on today and Monday. Uh, contact your local uh, race that you're supporting and see if you can get credentials to go and poll watch. Uh, and if you don't do it this time, be, be prepared next time, because I did talk to the administrator where I was and said, would you like volunteers to come and talk to you people about what to expect ahead of the next election? And she couldn't nod her head yes enough. So people, be aware of who your neighbors are. And those people in nursing homes, they need your attention every once in a while, and not just to get your vote, which is when they get it from elected officials. So that's, I mean, that's just a, a little sliver of what I saw this particular election cycle. Did you see cycle. outright fraud or just confused folks? I did in see, I, I didn't saw know. judges who didn't know diddly squat. Um, I'm sorry, but I saw, I saw out of seven judges that you and I are paying for there and two Board of Elections employees that you and I are paying for, there were two people there who were actually doing their job. And there was one person there who, when she assisted, in quotes, a voter. She uh, went through the eight names for Attorney General, but she spelled out one name. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's fraud. I'm yeah. sorry, that's fraud. So, uh, you know, <laughs> there's a lot to be thankful for this season of voting because so many people have awakened to the fact that they can run for office, like this fellow we had on this morning and there's a lot of more good candidates to choose from um, and that's a great thing and uh, people need to understand that it's <clears throat> the government isn't out there it's us and if if we're not taking care of it um, it, it won't take care of you and I think this primary is particularly important <clears throat> because there are so many hotly contested uh, races there's at least three really important ones as far as I'm concerned. Yep. And this is not trying to tell anyone how to vote, but I did early voting. It took me about six minutes. Mm -hmm. I imagine it'll be busier this weekend, but with everyone off doing their St. Paddy's Day reveling, today might be a great day to go on early vote. And um, it's a really great way to avoid lines on Tuesday and that old, I have to rush off to work, I can't vote yet. The primary is when we can vote for the best person so that we can win in November. That's right. 
You know, all three of us who are the co-hosts of this show uh, are asked by people who to vote for. When Katie right. and I own the Heartland, you know, everyone around Election Day, what do I do, what do I do, what do I, who am I for? And I know, Tom, you're in a similar situation. I'm wondering, you, Tom, who you were telling me in the car, you've had a number of phone calls. How do you handle these when people ask you who to vote for? Well, I, he tells them. <laughs> uh, you know, they're usually asking about a specific race. The attorney general race is probably the most confusing because there are eight candidates and there are a couple of big names, but people aren't sure that those are the names they ought to go with. And I agree. Aaron Goldstein is who I voted for. There are a couple of others there. The two leading folks are the least, uh, the folks that I would least like to see win. Uh, the former governor, Pat Quinn, should retire. And the other guys in the legislature, uh, uh, Kwame Raul, should stay in the legislature. He's represented his district well. He's um, pretty tied into the mainstream he's, Democrats. He's a totally bought-off machine Democrat, so we could do better. And Aaron Goldstein would be a joy to have as Attorney General. Similarly, in the governor's race, there's some very interesting candidates. I will probably be voting for the winner in November, but right now Dan Biss is my guy because he, more than anyone else, is un unencumbered by money. Uh, he probably wishes he had a little bit more to run this campaign, but uh, I think it's a really bright, uh, aggressive, independent choice to make this time. And finally, for Assessor, uh, which has been a very confusing race, even the Tribune, who felt that our colleague Andre Rayla got a, a, a raw deal in the whole nominating process, uh, still supported their, their working for Fritz Kagan. Write in Cam Davis for the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. It's pretty easy to do. In fact, once you do it, you might want to start writing in other people in, in subsequent elections. On the governor's race, I've had a lot of debate and dialogue with people around the, uh, the most two most more progressive candidates, which I would say would be Biss and Kennedy, as opposed to J.B. Pritzker. And Pritzker's been in the lead, but is it, kind of playing these guys off against each other. Um, what are your thoughts, either of you, about uh, you know the two two most progressive candidates fighting it out among each other? I'm I'm calling for people to give up on one and go with the other. Uh, I think there's been a lot of talk about that. I want to put in a plug for uh, looking at a woman who's on a ballot for AG. Sharon well, you're not Fairley. talking about the governor's race. No, nope, I'm talking back. about AG because uh, we we didn't talk about her in the in this just go round and. Uh, she is uh, closing on the, those two leads, unlike Aaron, who was our pick in Network 49. Um, so I want people to know that Sharon Fairley is out there. We had her in our show. She's good. On our show, she's com entirely capable. She's way more independent than either of those top guys, and uh, smart as a whip. Uh, and it would be a great upset and a great encouragement to women, to pe women of color, to uh, go forward and play politics. And I'll just suck in that. I voted for Aaron, but I've told people who asked, Sharon would also be a good choice. Yeah. Because I think she would be truly independent and has a really great record on the police oversight. Issue. And any thoughts on people uh, being encouraged not to vote for either Kennedy or Biss because one is closer? I'm still waiting for Chris Kennedy's campaign to take off. Um, <laughs> um, I like him. I, we've yeah. met several times. He was good on our show. Um, but Dan Biss is my guy. Yeah, I'm going with this, Me too. too. Okay. Well, that's it for what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> what are you all doing today out there? Are you still listening? Yeah, he's Can still listening. Can you hear us? All right. We're, we're going to bring on our third and final guest that um, Michael and Tom will finish because I have to go and do it's what we work just talked work. about. Yes. Uh, but Michael it's is the man who brought us this guest this time, and uh, I was happy to watch the film. Why don't you introduce uh, Dennis. Dennis Mueller. Well, hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Michael James. I'm introducing Dennis Mueller. And Dennis <laughs> Mueller is a longtime friend. Uh, he's uh, from Chicago, but now he resides in the great state of Vermont. Uh, is that the Grand State? No, that's the next one. Up. That's the next one over yeah. in New Hampshire. That's more Republican yeah, sometimes, yeah. yeah. But uh, Dennis uh, worked on the Nelson Algren film. He worked on the FBI's War on Black America. He worked on Howard Zinn. He's got some other tricks up his sleeve, so, so to speak. Good morning to you, Dennis. Good morning. It's wonderful to be back in Chicago. So you have a new film out along with Deb Ellis, and who uh, is not here today, but she is your partner in, these, in this film. And the film you have made is called Peace Has No Borders. And uh, it's, it's a wonderful little film. And Thank tell you. us a little bit about it, what motivated you, and how's it going? 
Deb and I had finished the Howards and You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train. The war had broken out. What we thought about is that we had done three films about activism. The FBI's War on Black Americas obviously was about coercion and the destruction of the Black Panther Party and black activist groups. Howard Zinn was about an activist icon. And so from following Howard, what we wanted to do was to follow an activist group that was doing so something in real time. We saw this thing called Peace Has No Borders, where Vietnam era veterans, VVAW and Vets for Peace, That's were, the Vietnam veterans against the war. Right. We're going to meet with Canadian former war resistors at the Peace Bridge in New York. So we thought, oh, this might be interesting. We were, as I said, we were thinking of doing a film, but a lot of people were doing films about the war, terrific films. And we wanted to do something different. So we went there uh, to this, and she saw an article about this guy, um, Patrick Hart. And so we thought, oh, this is interesting. Here's one of the war resistors. Let's talk to him. And that event kicked off a nine, ten year journey where we followed the story of the war resistors, the war resistors mean the Iraq veterans, who decided they did, would not kill no more. They decided that most of them had joined up and they had seen the horrors of the Iraq war and they said no more. But unfortunately Canada was not ruled by Pierre Trudeau as in the Vietnam era, right. but a new government had just taken power, Stephen Harper. Oh. And I could only describe Stephen Harper as a George Bush who was really smart. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a frightening thing, actually. And um, he did not feel the same way. So we filmed this 10-year struggle through ups and downs and not knowing they're interesting films to make, but they're really fascinating. What we, so what happened in the end, we, want, we set out wanting to start a film like Barbara Koppel's Harlan County, USA, mm -hmm. yeah. which was a great victory Amazing. for radicalism. Mm -hmm. Not for radicalism, for activism. Okay. What happens then when it doesn't quite work out? <laughs> you end up with Barbara Koppel's, I really think Barbara Koppel's is one of our greatest filmmakers. You end up with something like American Dream, where it's not quite as well known, where she received an Academy Award where you don't win. But in the end, it's like the fight is worth it. So we met incredible people, some people up in Toronto called the War Resisters Support Campaign, led by a woman. Um, named Michelle Robidoux, and it's just kind of wonderful to see people do something for other people where they really don't have anything to benefit. Yes, that was very amazing, and the woman whose name you just said, Michelle Robidoux. Again, Robidoux. She, was, she, was, she was so impressive, wasn't she? She was a, quite a woman. Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, quite a human being. Yeah. And, and while you were doing that, you did uh, have some conversations with Vietnam era uh, resistors, right? Yes. And how are they f looking at the, the the new crop? Well, at first, one of the first people we met was the late Dave Klein, and he was very supportive. And we met many, some of the people in the campaign, the War Resistor Support Cam Campaign, are former Vietnam era veterans mm -hmm. or Vietnam era people resistors who, who mm -hmm. went up to. Canada. So the situation in the movie is where Canada welcomed uh, resistors during the Vietnam War. Uh, during the Iraq War that shifted, partly because of Harper, maybe it was a different time, and there was also the issue of whether people had, uh, uh, in, back in, during the Vietnam War, it was resistance to the draft in part. In this case, it was people who were already in the military who decided they couldn't handle it anymore, for mostly for principled reasons. And uh, what, what was the situation? Because you had votes in Canada, in the legislature about this, and uh, it didn't always go as way we hoped, even though we looked good uh, building up to it. Yeah, so their strategy 
was to first put a motion before Parliament to give a recommendation, their meaning the war resistor support campaign, to put a motion before Parliament to give a recommendation that the resistors stay, which they won. And, yeah. the, and the polls showed that the majority of Canadians yes. were in favor of this. Yes, an Agnes poll showed that something like 60-something percent, and later on a poll showed, a different poll showed 55 percent. My numbers might be a little off, but uh, the gist of it, the gist of it the is that Canadians were by and large supportive of it. There was another election where it got tighter, however, the Conservatives still didn't have a clear majority. In Canada, for our listeners, um, there's actually three political parties. There are the Liberals, who are the traditional Canadian party, and kind of the old standard Trudeau was a part of. There's the new... Dem and the new Trudeau was part of that, too. Yeah, and, right, right, Justin. And the new Democrats, which are somewhat like a European Social Democrats, and hopefully, my French is so bad, Quebec... Uh, Quebecois? Yeah, Quebec, Cuba. I, this is terrible, my apologies. What are you trying to say? Have you been up there in Canada all that time? As a, the, the separatist party in Quebec. Quebecois. Quebecois, thank you. And, 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 and that party. So, they still, they still retained a majority in Parliament. The final election then that came is the Conservatives <coughs> took control. And then they set into action the deportations of different people. And our film kind of picked up because our characters were being deported. Yeah, that was really a strong piece of, of your film. The fact that you followed this story as long as you did, I want to congratulate you, Thank you for doing that kind of committed artistic statement as well as political statement. And the families that you followed were also beautiful to watch and witness. and. Uh, I, I, where is this film going to be shown that people can see it? We're going to be shown at Chicago Filmmakers in their new facility, which I kind of... That's Firehouse on Ridge? Your Firehouse oh, on is. Ridge. Okay. Um, next Saturday, the 24th at 8 o'clock. <laughs> it's on Ridge and... The address 50... It's at, it's at Ridge and Wayne, basically. Right, right off the, isn't it right off the drive? Is it go yes, out? Yes, it's and very think, easy yeah, to get to Yeah, I can remember. Yeah, it's really easy. Yeah. So the 24th, at what time? Sorry? 8 o'clock. Okay. Good. Good, good. And I'm, I'm curious, one of the frustrations of a documentary maker must be what happens to your story after you finished it. So there's been a change in government again in Canada. How do you think the families you followed would fare today? inside of this uh, this movement to resist the war? Mm, well, Justin is Prime Minister now, so they'd fare a little better, but to complete the story, which might answer your question sure. at the same time, I love the question, <laughs> is that Justin then became pr Prime Minister. The Canadians were had it up to here with mm. Harper. You folks out there can't see, but you know what I mean when I say <laughs> up to here. And they elected uh, Justin Trudeau. And he has not deported everybody, so they remain in kind of limbo. So, but two of our characters end up in jail. Mm -hmm. Before Trudeau. Before Trudeau. Right. So it's a victory of sorts. But there was it's U.S. military jails. Yes. They got sent back. And here. they got sent for long terms, 25 months. Yeah, overly cruel. Yeah, because specifically they have spoken out against the war while in Canada. Uh, Dennis, you have another film in the works you're working on. I'd like to, can you talk about that? A little bit. Um, follow, it, it has to do with our one of our favorite pe people in American history and world history, uh, John Brown. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm doing a film about the author Russell Becks. And Russell wrote the book Cloud, Cloud Splitter. Splitter. And in that John Brown is the main character. The story is told from the point of view point of view of his son, and his son was never he never wrote anything or like that. So Russell has decided that he would tell the story through uh, him, and it's part of a long story film about the author Russell Banks, who is um, one of America's terrific authors. And um, he really understands race and class. 
I mean, really understands it in America, and the disgruntled, because he's from the working class, however successful he is, and he's the hardest working artist I've ever seen. And speaking about and race he lives and class, in Vermont. he lives in uh, right across the lake in Keene, New York, uh -huh. and and that's how we got to know about John Brown because it's just down the road. So talking again about peace has no borders, sure. um, I'm curious about your last comments on uh, the the two former uh, uh, GIs who were jailed uh, in a military prison because they spoke out against the war in Canada. Well, our current president has spoken out against the war. Um, but he's still in the White House. Do you find any irony that military justice has people in Canada being locked up when they try to when they're deported and come back here? But our sitting president, well, we know can tweet about anything. Again, yeah, right? yeah, lots. <clears throat> I see lots of irony. Um, one of our characters, the only character that went back that didn't get arrested, had witnessed by a real time, you know, they have cameras on the planes that were going there and they were strafing buildings and as they came out, like in the um, WikiLeaks leak, they just kill them. So he s pointed out, what are the bullet holes doing on the fuselages underneath? And they told him, there it be quiet. So when he goes to turn himself in or goes across the border, there's nothing there. They let him pass because I viewed that he has something on them. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't want that to be. Sh they don't want people to know that that was an illegal war. That was a w war that one who wasn't one of our. He's up in Canada still, but he wasn't one of our characters. Witnessed. This is, oh, this is horrible. But witnessed a soldier weeping while the other people are kicking the heads of someone like a soccer ball. And the soldier that was weeping was saying, we lost it, we lost it. So some of our characters, that's what they witnessed. One of our characters, Patrick Hart, heard people come back, hey, you know, you, I, when I'm driving a convoy, you, you just got to keep going. They were talking about the kids. They're just speed bumps to me. Oh, yeah. And so Patrick goes, I'm a father. This, like, shook me. So, yeah, I, I find it ironic. And I think that because their numbers are so small, I think what we can do here in the United States, uh, um, Vets for Peace and the Vietnam Veterans Against the War can l help lead this, as we can call for amnesty for those people. You know, they should be able to come back to the United States or stay in Canada, but at least to visit their families. Uh, Dennis Mueller, your film Peace Has No Borders, They Made a Choice and Paid a Price. Uh, I understand it is submitted uh, to Sundance Film Festival? No, no? We, no it, 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 was, it was rejected, but you know, we had a, we've been broadcast on RT. Across, and What's RT? Russian TV. Wow. <laughs> and not popular uh, these days. Not popular <laughs> these days, but we're along with, you know, a, a lot of people on American Russian television. Well, I'm sure. Uh, Tom Hartman, um, <laughs> Chris Hedges, you know, people like that. That's nice company to be in. Um, and you are going to be at the opening on the 24th? Yes, and, and I'm so looking forward to that. I'll make a little plug for Chicago Filmmakers, designed by James Bond, who is the master of sound and all that, which was what really drew me to want our film to be shown there. It's a small theater, so, you know, there's only 50-something seats, so please come early. And where does the film go? Where else are you showing it around the country? Well, it's going to be on DirecTV, so everybody can get it. And I think it, May 3rd or something like that. It's coming up. It'll be... You can see there, it's available through IndyCam for schools, purchases, universities, and for activist groups for doing group showings. Just, indi just indicate, just contact them and they'll be glad to set it up for you. Well, I'm glad you indicated us. <laughs> yes, yes, and I'm glad I got the word correct the second time. The film is Peace Has No Borders. Thanks a lot, Dennis Mueller, for sharing some of your insights about making this wonderful film. You've been listening to Live from the Heartland on WLUW 88.7. Let's listen to some more Gaelic Storm as we go out and thank our other guests, Ram 
uh, Vila Balam and Leanna Wallace and Onyx York and Dennis Mueller. Uh, next week we're going to have a lively show, but we still have to fill in some of our guests. So if you'd like to be in this program, give us a call. Oh, you spilled the beans. <laughs> and uh, we're happy to accommodate you over the next few And weeks. we encourage you all to do good in the world because the world needs all the good that we do. Absolutely. All power to the people. Listen Please to the vote. Yeah, no, make sure you vote. you got till Tuesday to do it.